morning, good day, good evening, good night, wherever you are dialing in for another one of our Sunday School series. We appreciate you dialing in. As always, if you have any questions, comments, hit them in the uh, comments below or go to our website at webbaptist.com. Hit the like and the subscribe so therefore every time a video is made, you'll be notified when they come uh, uh, premiere. All right, today we are looking in the Sunday School series, we're looking at session seven, Russell. Okay, so again, we're moving forward. We're in Genesis. We're still talking about uh, Jacob. We saw where uh, he, <laughs> he, he stole the birthright. Uh, he stole the blessing. He fled, spent the last 20 years dealing with Laban, got two wives to show for. He's got concubines. He's got a whole bunch of children who will eventually become the tribes of Israel. And so we're seeing that uh, th this episode here that we're looking at, some of you probably already know what it is. It's the wrestling of him and God. And we're going to get into that a little bit deeper. So to understand the context of where we are, following his final confrontation with Laban at Mitzvah, uh, Jacob continued home uh, on his homeward uh, journey. As he traveled, God's angels met him, and Jacob named the place uh, Mahayim, which means two camps. It might have referred to Jacob's camp and Esau's camp or to the camps that Jacob set up for his family. Regardless, Jacob uh, soon experienced two meetings, one with God followed by the one with Esau. Okay, Jacob learned from his scouts that Esau was coming to meet him, but he wasn't alone. Jacob's older brother was accompanied by 400 men. Fearful and distressed, Jacob began devising a scheme of his um, protection. As noted above, he divided his camp into two groups. He reasoned that if Esau attacks one of the groups, second camp would have a reason to escape. So we're kind of setting the stage for, for this lesson. So Jacob is scared of his brother. Remember his, his brother, last time he met his brother, it was 20 years ago, uh, Esau was very upset. <laughs> he was mad, and he had every reason to be mad because his brother was deceitful and, and uh, deceived his father in getting the blessing that belonged to Esau. So the last thing that um, Jacob knew of his brother was fleeing uh, for the fear of his life. <laughs> but in the middle of all that, Jacob found God. He, 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 uh, he heard about the blessing and the promise and the covenant that was going to go through him uh, that was given to his grandfather and to his father and to him. So he'd benefit from that. So he got two wives. He's got, a, like I said, a whole slew of kids. He, he's rich. He's prospered. And, and so now he's coming home. And uh, Jacob had to know at some point that going home was not going to be a, 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 you know, a, a very friendly affair. <laughs> so he still has to address the wrongs that he did to his brother. Um I'm pretty sure Jacob in the back of his mind was thinking, man, he's going to kill me. <laughs> so, but at the same time, he's got to go home. And sometimes when we go home, we got to face up to those, those situations that we got to face up to those sins. We got to face up to those problems that we created. So that's where we are. And that's what's setting the stage. So he's sitting here. He's t his family went across the river and he stayed where he's at. Uh, he's alone. And uh, so he's, preparing for the worst. He just is. He's kind of accepting the fact that you know, he's probably going to be killed, but he's going to still rely on God to fulfill his promise. So we pick up the story, Genesis 32, 22 through 24. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two slave women, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford to Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, along with all his possessions. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. <laughs> so we got we got these uh, you know these verses that are kind of very truncated, uh, and then at the end uh, he's left alone. He's going to wrestle with the man uh, uh, until day, day daybreak. So uh, so <laughs> that that. Cut, it's just it, it, to me, it's kind of funny or comical, just just the way all that did. Because here's a man that's very afraid, and he's pretty much taking his everything that he's on, everything that's important to him. He crossed the river and left them across the river where he stayed alone. Oh yeah, by the way, he wrestled with a man all night. So it, 
anyway, uh, enough of my nonsense. <laughs> so looking at this, you know, we're looking at uh, while the culture accepted such practice uh, as far as a concubine, because we're looking at the two slave women, um, and, and it was culturally accepted at the time, but that was not well, that was not God's plan. We saw that with uh, Sarai or Sarah, as she later became. She she was trying to push God's plan forward by using her handmaiden. Remember, so but that's not what God wanted to do, was it? Uh, now God used Ishmael to to his you know to his uh, to his glory and to his plans and to his prophecies until uh, as God always will. But the blessing that was promised to Abram and Abraham, later on Abraham and his descendants, had nothing to do with Ishmael at all. Okay, so, so we see that that practice of concubines, while it was culturally accepted, uh, it was never God's plan. Uh, the, the scriptures uh, set forth God's ideal for, for the God, since the Garden of Eden uh, as uh, a marriage between one man and one woman. So uh, in cases where men took concubines, negative results, including disharmony, jealousy, and uh, prevailed in the family. Well, the biggest uh, example of that to me is uh, King Solomon. I mean, look at it. He had over 700 concubines, and uh, they all kind of pulled his heart away from God and into uh, you know, uh, foreign uh, religions and practices and, and faiths and that kind of stuff. So... I can see where that could be a problem, and that was not what God has in plan. So we look at left alone. The word you know uh, rendered also conveys an idea of separation, isolation, isolation. Jacob's encounter with God near the ford of Jabbok River reminds us that time will come when each of us in our lives must come to face Him alone. We cannot lean on uh, anyone else's faith. Must decide for ourselves how we will respond to Him. Eventually, we're going to find ourselves alone with God, and we're, we're going to have to you know, either answer for our problems or we're going to have to talk to God and deal with it and with the situations that we're in, whether we're in the valleys or on the plateaus and the indecisions in our lives, the pain in our lives. Uh, eventually, we will be alone. So we're talking about the man. Uh, again, <laughs> Bible scholars have uh, typically identified the man as God or as an angel carrying God's authority. Of the various Hebrew words for man, the word used here denotes a man who is uh, individual, in contrast to mankind in general. In some contexts, the term was also rendered champion. So we're also looking at that. So if we look at uh, Kittner real quick, he's got a pretty good insight, and this is a pretty lengthy, so I'll try to, you know, try to read through it real quick. The identity of Jacob's assailant emerges only gradually, and Jacob quickly sees every clue to it. Behind the human limitations, there is an awesome reserve of power, and behind the reluctance to be overtaken by day could be elusive of some night phantom or else the holiness of God, whose face must not be seen. Jacob's answering uh, plea, uh, answering plea of the blessing showed that he glimpsed the truth and the further exchanges dispel all doubt, both by what was said and by what was withheld. Interesting. So uh, the conflict brought to a head at the battling and the groping of life uh, of a lifetime. Jacob's desperation, uh, desperate embrace vividly expresses the uh, ambivalent attitude uh, uh, to God. Of, uh, of love and eternity, defiance and dependence. It was against him, not Esau or Laban, that he had been pitted his strength. He now discovered, yet the initiative had been God's, as it was his right to chasten his pride and challenge his tenacity. With the uh, So he says, the crippling and the uh, naming show that God's ends were still the same. He would have all of Jacob's will to win, will attain and obtain, yet purged of self-sufficiency and uh, redirected to the proper object of man's love, God himself. Okay, so as we will see, we, I kind of got ahead a little bit on that, but I thought that whole thing with Kittner is pretty interesting. As, uh, as we will see in regards to the whole situation with Jacob and this man that he's wrestling with all night. 
Um, now, question, how can uh, time, alone, uh, time alone calm our anxiety, anxieties and give us clarity? How can time alone calm our anxieties and give us clarity? Uh, well, that's a good question. You answer that question. Uh, sometimes we need time to uh, think about things, pray about things, ponder on things to get to kind of give it full meaning. Uh, sometimes when we make a knee jerk re reaction or a decision based on something and we just react, it's usually the wrong reaction, is it not? And then we tell ourselves later on, man, I wish I would have done that differently. And we kind of have that regret. So having that time set aside gives us time to think, to pray, to ponder, uh, and before we make those decisions. So moving on, Genesis 32, 25, 29. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip. <laughs> so, wow, okay, so he struck his hip. Um, so he struck Jacob's hip socket as, as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Again, I think that Jacob kind of gets an idea. He gets a glimpse of the truth of who he's re wrestling with. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, Please tell me your name. But he answered, Why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Okay. So again, I mean, when you kind of read this, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a, I don't know, is it kind of odd to you in this whole situation where why would God wrestle with, with Jacob? What's the bigger picture here? I think the bigger picture is Jacob wrestled with, with God in everything. Okay, uh, there was time he's relying on God when he needs God, but he's not relying on God when times are good. Okay, and and he he wrestled for and, and a lot of times we wrestle with God, do we not? Uh, there's a lot of times we wrestle with God's truth, we wrestle with God's spirit. Uh, there's a lot of times, especially before you're saved, you're wrestling with God, uh, trying to make that decision when the Holy Spirit and His Counselor is trying to. Uh, you know, save you and trying to turn you to, to God, are you not? So many times we wrestle with God, uh, and fortunately he's not knocking out our, uh, our hip socket. Uh, but if we continue to struggle, we ignore the consequence that could be just as disastrous, if not worse. Uh, so when we look at the notes of this, so uh, the whole daybreak thing, the response of the man rising, so uh, signify that Jacob was dealing with a superior being. So we kind of knew that. And the name thing, in biblical times, we got to remember that names carry weight, name carries power, name carries destiny. And that is very important for us to remember. So, uh, so when we know the name, so Jacob's trying to, to divine, you know, trying to, to get an idea who, just who it is. He has a feeling that he's dealing with God, but he's not sure which way, is this truly God? And to know the name of God, he thinks that he's going to have power over God. He thinks he's going to have some kind of special meaning if he knows the name of God. <laughs> but as we see where he says, why do you ask my name? Because even if you know the name of God, you've got no power over him. <laughs> so uh, in, the, in time, what does God do? You know, people like Moses, what is my name? I am, you know, so these names that we have in the Bible that we see of God is what we use to identify in our relationship to God. And we see a lot of these names in the Old Testament are names given to God in relation to the, the people at the time or the situation at the time for the nation of Israel. That does not mean that we control God or know Him and we can put Him in a box. No, it's not. We identify that particular time, that particular event, where God has chosen to reveal Himself in such manner. That's all it is. But in Jacob's mind, he's thinking, if I know the name of God, I got something special. And I can kind of feel that, you know, with the answer, why do you want to know my name? God was kind of laughing at him because... Jacob is really thinking in an inferior way that 
this makes any difference. Uh, it's kind of obvious that you're messing with someone. If he can hit your, <laughs> knock your hip bone out of, out of the socket, that's a pretty powerful individual I wouldn't want to mess with. So that tradition of knowing the name is very important back then. So that, but, and that's where that comes from. He, he's struck, he's, striving to get that name. So in some situations, knowing a person's name could also imply to have some degree of power over them, good or for evil. However, it is doubtful that the Jake was trying to exert any control uh, in this context. He simply wanted to know more about the one who was blessing him. And that's a that is a possibility as well. Either way, I think Jacob really wanted to confirm is this God? Are, are you God? Or is this really you? Um, it's nighttime. He's wrestling in the dark with this man. Obviously, if you know anything about wrestling, you're grabbing, you're holding, you're throwing, you're pulling down, you're, you're doing a lot of different things. And if he's wrestling with this man all night, they're grabbing each other and he feels the arms, legs, uh, a choke hold, who knows? So he knows he's actually rolling or wrestling with a man. And, uh, and it comes very clear through the interaction that this is more than a man. Now, does that mean Jacob beat God? No, <laughs> of course not. I think this whole situation, again, if we remember what Kittner said, uh, this is more of a revelation and showing that, Jacob, you've been wrestling with man. You've been wrestling with me. It's time to put an end to that. And that's what this whole situation is about. Because when Jacob's done with this, he's a new man altogether. This is not the same man after this night of wrestling. So changed his name. So we we looking at where he named him Israel. So given, and that also goes to show you that this man has power, that he is willing to change a person's name. That's very important. Jacob's divine opponent may have allowed him to win the wrestling match, but he still had authority over him uh, by the demonstration of changing his name. So that's very important. After his encounter with God, Jacob limped physically as a reminder of his struggle with God. But more importantly, by God's gradual, it began to transform the way Jacob lived. Jacob's struggle with God created a new moral uh, strength and loyalty to God that guided him for the rest of his life. So again, that's what I'm saying is that struggle is done. Uh, Jacob had refused to let go of his opponent until his opponent blessed him. This implies Jacob's recognition he was dealing with a superior being. In ancient thought, blessings were generally conferred from the greater to the lesser. Jacob had stolen his father's blessings, so he longed for God to provide a legitimate blessing for him. Interesting. <laughs> so somebody didn't steal his blessing like he did. Question, how did uh, receiving a new name set the future course for Jacob? How can change in the identity serve as a blessing? Oh, well, we just addressed that, didn't we? Jacob is known as a deceiver. He struggled with men. He was a conniving. He was cunning. But after this night, he would be known as Israel, and he's a different, completely person, new person. Now, when we're saved and we're, we're Christians and we're born again, we don't change names. However, uh, we change in our hearts. We change in our personality. People should see a significant difference between you before and after that you're saved. And it may not be immediate, but it's going to be that gradual change that in that struggle uh, that you're having with God. And as you learn and grow as a Christian, people should be able to see a new you, a new creation, a new creature, so to speak, in the Word of God than in the absence of God. So before and after, there should be a very telling picture of what God has done in your life when you make that acceptance of Him. So uh, so how do we receive a new name, set the future course for Jacob? I mean, the struggle's over. Uh, God was kind of pretty much telling him, uh, we're done here. It's time to get busy with the, the plans that I have for you. It's time for us to get, get busy on that. So that, that's kind of what the way I take it. Now, if we look at Holman uh, real quick, uh, let's see, we should, we should not dwell on the physical dimensions of the struggle. 
because the real key was the spiritual warfare. We do well to think about our needs and how God stands ready for us to call on Him. This text reminds us uh, to base our prayers on God's Word. Our own unworthiness, worthiness, and a specific and clear need for help, and a remembrance of His promise. So again, uh, how, you know, we look at our own struggles, and that's kind of what I'm seeing here in the the commentary. Is this is a spiritual thing? Now, it was it a physical fight? As far as I know, this was a physical wrestling match between God and, and Jacob. But this could also be a spiritual uh, warfare, spiritual struggle as well. We have them all the time, do we not? So moving on, verse 32, 30 through 32. Uh, Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, and yet my life has been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Peniel. Limping because of his hip. That is why still today the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip uh, socket at the thigh muscle. So, okay, uh, so basically what's going on here is Jacob's uh, he, he's got a new walk. <laughs> so uh, he's limping for the rest of his life and, and he's got a reminder uh, for the rest of his life uh, that, you know, yeah, God. God did that to him. Did he have to? Uh, I think he had to uh, because there has to be a reminder. I mean, yeah, God can pop in his life every day to talk to him and remind him of the gifts and remind him of who he is. But at the same time, uh, a lot of times our faith has to be honed in the absence of the physical. Uh, faith is believing without seeing, is it not? And that's kind of what Jacob has to do. He's always going to have a permanent reminder of his wrestling match with God. It wasn't so much a wrestling match as it was a struggle, and God was making it clear to him, those days are behind you. Moving forward, you have sons, uh, and, and you have children. You're wealthy. You're going to go back to your homeland. And we're going to pick up the pieces and we're going to start moving forward with this promise that I gave to Abraham. So uh, so reading that, although the uh, match resulted in Jacob's victory, that victory came with a painful injury that would always remind him that we prevail against God by uh, yielding to him. No longer a uh, deceived, Jacob was a new person. No longer a deceiver now, he's a new person. The beginning of a new spiritual walk as Israel, the one who prevails with God. So, uh, you know, J moving forward, Jacob is a whole new person altogether. So now we look at the thigh. What's the serious thing about that? The Is Israelites view the thigh as the seat of vital function, particular procreation in patriarchal times, placed hand under the, th uh, under the thigh, firm the strongest oath. Elsewhere in Scripture, striking one's thigh could symbolize intense grief and repentance. When his divine opponent struck Jacob's thigh, he not only demonstrated his superiority, but he also indicated the very base of Jacob's life had been changed. Okay, so we're seeing a little bit of history and tradition mixed in with the Bible, and we see where things like this happen that have a, an impact just not on Jacob's life, but on the nation of Israel going forward. So question, how did Jacob's action demonstrate trust in God? Well, you know, he wrestled with God and moving forward, uh, as a result of this wrestling match, he's a changed person. Uh, the str struggle's no longer there. There's no longer any doubt. You don't have to deal with people like Laban or Esau. You are your own man. You have your kids. You have your wealth. I'm going to use you, and it's time for us to move forward with that plan. So that's where all that comes in. So how did Jacob's actions demonstrate trust in God? Moving forward. Uh, he, he's going to move forward with the plan. He wrestled with God, and he got the blessing. Uh, and at the same time, he yielded to God. He, he accepted the change of who he is. Uh, that's how people see the change in us, is we yield to God's Spirit. Do we not? If we don't, how can we sit there and say we're children of God? How can we show true repentance? How do we show true conversion uh, under the cross of Jesus Christ? Um, 
how do we so show submission? How do we show that change to a world? It has to take place inside. We, we, we're not going to survive that struggle. God's going to be to that struggle every time. And he'll bless us for it. So wrapping up, summarize, people should expect to counter in God's in times of their greatest need. Amen. Believers have a new identity after they encounter God. Amen. And that usually comes at the foot of the cross, is it not? Believers can celebrate God's working in their lives. Amen. <laughs> Do you look in your life, the, the spiritual growth that happens in your life? Can you tell how you've grown spiritually six months from, you know, six months ago to now or uh, a year ago? How does your life look? How does your spiritual walk measure up? Do you see a change? Do you see improvement? Do you see growth? You should. Uh, and, and if God's active in your life, man, you're going to see that stuff. And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm amazed, humbled by God working in my life in so many different areas that it's just unreal. Uh, and, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm speechless at times. Sometimes he's saving me from myself. And that is uh, uh, truly a blessing to me. And I hope that I'm a blessing to those around me uh, with my Christian walk. So uh, at the same time, you know, believers can celebrate that God is uh, working in your life. Yes, He's working in your life, wherever you are. And I tell you that from the, from the get-go all the time. Okay. Uh, thank you for dialing in for another one of our Sunday School series. I appreciate it. Again, questions or comments, leave them in the comments below as always. Uh, you're invited to come here to Web Baptist. Join us for an evening or, or a, a morning of worship, uh, either on uh, Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights. We have the dinner and the Bible study. You're always you're our, our beloved guest. We don't have visitors here. You are our guest, and we'd love to have you here for a day of worship. If you can't come to Web Baptist, by all means, get plugged in and get involved in a Bible-based church wherever you are. And I guarantee you, God is going to use you in that spot. You're going to be a blessing to them and they will be a blessing to you. You're going to have those struggles in your life with God repeatedly. Okay. But our submission to God will help us with those struggles. Again, we can always see those struggles. We should always see those growths in our Christian walk. Okay. Until next time, take care and God bless.